so let's let's get started. So, uh, Peter, let's just do a quick intro. Like, why don't you just tell everybody about who you are, what you're doing, Spin Top Ventures, et cetera, and just give a little overview of like the kind of companies you invest in, et cetera, investment thesis, all that good stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, so I start with Spin Top Ventures. We are an uh, early tech, uh, early stage tech VC. Uh, we we invest in the Nordics. Um, uh, we've been around for more than 10 years, 11, 11 years, and now we are a team of uh, six people. Uh, myself, I joined uh, four years ago uh, when, when we launched a third fund that was a little, a little bigger than the previous funds. So we increased the team so that at that point of time we were four partners. And now, now we have two more, no, two more people in the team after that. Uh, so we, over the years, we invested in uh, 35, uh, 36 companies, uh, uh, and our tickets are given give and take from five to 50 million, like the initial tickets, and then with the intention that we want to continue to invest in the companies uh, once invested, and then we sit sit on the board and try to contribute and help our companies where where we can add value. Uh, that's our, our thinking. Uh, my background is uh, many, many years as a CEO of Price Runner. Price Runner is a, a, a price comparison site. People in the Nordics often know about it. Uh, so I, I was there until we sold the company five years ago. Uh, and uh, um, so that was more than 10 years after that, I did some angel investments uh, in a couple of different companies. I was also a little involved in the Spin Top Fund, joined the board for for a company. And then when it was time to make a bigger fund, then, uh, then I started to work full time with this. Got it. Thank you so much. Awesome context. OK, so I have a question for you. And I think this is, wait, Simon's here. Hi, Simon. Wait, I don't know if Simon's here. Simon might be joining us. So there's yep. the, so this this whole session was in effect supposed to be an, a, a panel discussion with Simon Olson, who's the founding partner at Greens Venture and XY Ventures. Um, but I think Simon's in traffic, so he's going to try to pop in. And meanwhile, Peter and I are just going. I'm just going to interview Peter. And let's see. Looks like Simon's joining. Okay. So Simon, if you join us, I am going to introduce you. Jason's coming in too. Oh, but Jason's muted, I think. Yeah, I can't hear him either. Yes. There we go. Sorry to jump and interrupt there, Diana, mid-flow. Simon is now in session, uh, so I've just added him in. I'm just checking. Simon, can you hear us? I can you know, hear you. Can you hear me? We can. We can't yeah. see you. You need to click, I think, the video button there to display your video. Yeah, it seems like it isn't really working that well. Okay, so it you, it's you could try it, but... on the settings tab and you could try to select the correct video in there. If that doesn't work, we'll just press on with audio, I think, if that suits you, Simon. Yeah, sure. Let's just go ahead with audio for now. Great. Maybe you could uh, restart that, Diana. We're recording this one, so we'll just kind of start from the beginning. And sorry, everyone, for tuning in. We'll... It was important to get Simon in because he's an awesome person, so I didn't want to miss out on that. So I'll leave you uh, back together again and uh, take two. Thanks a lot. Thanks. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So apologies to everyone who just heard take one, but not apologies because Peter's super fascinating. So you'll definitely enjoy hearing his story again. Peter, my challenge to you is to tell your story differently than the way you just told it completely different and see how that goes. So, um, <laughs> so basically quick introductions, this session, how to blow away VCs at seed stage. I have Simon Olson, who's the founding partner at green ventures and XY ventures here. And Peter Carlson who's the partner at spin top ventures here. And we're going to talk through just all the secrets to funding and seed stage success. And it's going to be super fun. I'm Diana. Um, I can give you more context about me later, but let's talk about these guys first. So um, Peter, why don't you introduce yourself one more time uh, with a spin and Simon, <laughs> I'll let you introduce yourself for the first time. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thanks. Okay, go. I'm ready. Then, then I do it very quickly since I, I, I suppose some people heard it uh, the first time. Uh, spin top venture, uh, uh, early stage tech investor. We invest in the Nordics. Uh, initial tickets, five to 50 million sec with the intention to continue to invest, uh, looking for scalable tech startups. Uh, 
Uh, my background, Price Runner, uh, international price comparison site. So I was a CEO there for more than 10 years. Uh, we sold it five years ago. Uh, uh, did a couple of angel investments with uh, a, a number of companies. Realized that I, this is what I like to do. And uh, we also realized that I added value to the companies where, where, where I invested and worked with, uh, which is not obvious from the beginning that you since as a ceo you're quite a generalist and uh, it's not always obvious where you should add value and uh, and then i, I was involved in spin top uh, prior to that uh, i was on a board for one of the companies and i invested myself in in the second fund and then it was time for the third fund which was a bigger fund so i joined the team full time and now we are six people in our team um, spread out across Nordic. So we are used to work in this digital format. Awesome. Peter, quick follow up question. What's the size of the third fund? Uh, 60 million euros. 60 and, million. Uh, and there is an upcoming fourth fund uh, now that will be even bigger. OK, awesome. Thanks so much. Um, now, Simon. Oh, thanks very much for telling your story now three times, I think, because I made you tell it to me before, too, before this whole session. So, Simon, your turn. Um, can you please just introduce yeah. yourself and everything, all the good stuff? So. Sure, all the good stuff. Uh, OK, so my name is, is Simon Olson, and um, I am at the moment running Greens and also running XY um, that invests into primarily pre-seed startups. And both of these funds have a little bit of a different focus. Uh, the Greens one invests primarily into the sort of Spotify alumni network in Stockholm, whilst XY invests into uh, Acceler graduates from one of the larger uh, accelerated programs in Bay Area. And really what we try to sort of figure out and invest in is, is uh, uh, primarily deep tech and, and disruptive technologies. Uh, and to follow Peter's good example, I'd say that our ticket size is sort of ranges uh, from anything in, in terms of agreements from 20,000 uh, euros up to the higher end of XY, which is probably a million euros. So uh, it, it, it really depends. It's a, it's a little bit of a scale there. Um, and my background, um, I have I've started out, I'm actually an engineer. Uh, so energy engineer is, is, is close to heart uh, and did my first company seven years ago in Boston. And from there, um, I managed to, to get some, some, uh, some money when I exited that company and started doing some investments into the startup scene and hang around a lot of the accelerated programs in both in Boston, but then a little bit later in Bay Area as well. Um, so I've been working quite a lot pro bono with this accelerated programs, doing some angel investments. And then uh, about a year ago, I got, I got talking to, to uh, Adeo Ressi, who's uh, one of the founder of Founder Institute, um, and uh, had a chat about joining his venture team. But then essentially he told me, no, uh, start your own fund and I'll join you. Uh, so, so that was sort of the launching point for, for XY and um, um, really, really just trying to, to have fun and do interesting investments, basically. I love it. Okay, super interesting. Okay, I think I know the direction we should take. And this is going to be free flow slash I also have prepared questions. But what's exciting <laughs> for the audience here is um, I didn't give Simon or Peter the questions in advance on purpose because I find it much more fun to see them squirm on the spot, which is what they put all their founders through when they ask questions. So I figure we'll just flip the tables and make them go through this today. So, <laughs> so the next question. Um, so Peter, I think, look, with Spin Top Ventures, it's, you know, you invest in founders that are on a mission and Simon, you're investing in like deep tech and disruptive technology. So Talk to me a little bit, both of you, about what y'all think are actually problems that are worth solving. And maybe you can give me a couple examples from your portfolio of companies that you really feel like are solving problems that are in alignment with your core thesis and mission around whether it's finding mission driven founders or whether it's finding deep technology that's super disruptive. Um, Peter, you first. <laughs> I, I. I, I think um, those missions that can be very, very broad, uh, uh, hel helping people with their everyday life. Uh, if if you have a, a service that do that, that's that's solving a mission, uh, obviously, as one example. Uh, 
I, I think we, uh, if I give a, an example of one of our portfolio that I think contributes uh, in a huge way to uh, sustainability, which is one of our focus areas, and, and sustainability can be very broad. We have a portfolio company called World Favor. Uh, it's a sustainability management platform where comp companies can report their their uh, both the CO2 uh, effects, but also a lot of other other topics uh, related to sustainability, and we see that uh, if if we get a lot of companies to report on their actions, uh, that increases transparency, and that will have an effect for companies to improve just a little bit. And if you can get uh, uh, hundred or thousand or companies to report and be a little more conscious about their operations, you will have major effects. Uh, so we have one, ex one example of a company that have a, a really purpose driven mission where you can, where you can see tangible results. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Peter. Okay, Simon, over to you. <laughs> yeah. So, so, <laughs> I'd say that that what we what we tend to look for are companies that that solves a substantial engineering challenge at core. So so really what what I what I want to get down to is is uh, is the technological forefront, and and uh, that can take um, they can take many directions, and that's why we're pretty agnostic in terms of industries that we venture into. But one of those industries that I personally enjoy quite a lot are under digitalized industries overall. So uh, a couple of, of them comes to mind. We, we've looked at a couple of healthcare deals. We looked at a couple of, of, of uh, manufacturing deals. We've also looked into to DeFi, those kinds of, of, of companies overall. Uh, but uh, the cases that we look for, the thing that they have in common is essentially that they they do something new with technology. And so an example from, from, from my portfolio is a company within manufacturing that has started to unravel sort of the, the mystery behind Industry 4.0, where you basically connect different kinds of sensory inputs to, to data uh, management platform. Uh, but not only just sensory inputs, but then com combine it with different kinds of like visual uh, uh, machine learning and and other uh, types of, of sensory inputs. Uh, and those cases are interesting because uh, up until now, basically it, it, ha it hasn't been on the agenda for a lot of, of, of their clients, right? Because you, you're you're probably usually at the point where where you look at let's say a machine or a production line and say that well it's it's a it's a manual process we have an operator and doing certain stuff um, and the output from that is purely you know manual so 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 they basically go from from machine to pen and paper and then into to a, a data storage system and so really what we were trying to do in that case is to just streamline the entire data flow process and make sure that you can connect. Uh, Connect, well, connect into to many different kinds of data sources to allow for free flow and then also uh, a predictive sort of uh, management and maintenance systems. Uh, we've also looked at weird, <laughs> weird examples in terms of like uh, tur turbo algorithms for, for uh, uh, certain stages of rockets. Uh, and we've also looked at, at uh, a couple of, of samples of uh, low altitude flight computers. Um, on nav computers for for uh, autonomous helicopters, which is also quite fascinating in itself. Um, so I'd say that we have a quite widespread overall, just synthesizing all up here um, uh, about the companies that we look at. But the thing that they have in common is that they do something unique with technology and try to sort of push the envelope uh, in terms of their uh, respective industry. That's great, Simon. And actually, Peter, oh, back over to you with a quick follow up. So where Simon's describing that the thing that you Simon, you have in common with your portfolio companies is they do something very unique with technology. Peter, what would you say? Is there a similar theme to do you have a, do you have a similar throw line to the companies that you invest in or is it broadly across multiple categories? It, it, it's uh, it's broader. Uh, it's always software based, uh, but it doesn't have to be a source business, as, uh, et cetera. Uh, internally, we always ask ourselves, okay, well, uh, with this company, what are they doing good that it's good for the society? Or, or are they 
or are they taking away any negative things or are they doing any positive things? So we want to ask, answer ourselves yes on that question. Yes, impact, 100%. Okay, so let's talk about metrics. Since this is all about how to blow away VCs at a seed stage, so what sort of metrics do you look for in your investments that really show you a company is on top of their game and you're just like, holy crap, that's amazing. So I, I mean, I, re I realize it's going to range because it depends on if you're investing in different categories or types of companies. So if you are looking at B2B, B2C, a whole bunch of different types, maybe illuminate a little bit about the metrics you look for for those specific categories for the entrepreneurs in the room that are thinking like, oh, I'm in deep tech. What metrics are you looking for? Oh, I'm in consumer tech. What kind of metrics are you looking for? So let's dive into some numbers here. Um, I'm going to flip it and make Simon start first this time. And then Peter, you'll start next just to keep throwing some yeah. curveballs. Okay, go. Let, let, let me squirm for a bit here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but I, I'll, I'll say that it, it really depends on the company that we, we look into, but it, in terms of uh, just taking a step back because it's quite easy to just go into growth metrics, right. Or, or traction based metrics. But I say that, um, in general terms, I look for, for three different things because it's so early when we venture into a company. Um, and, and those three things are first and foremost uh, that it's the right kind of team uh, and that the founding team has actually worked together before. Ideally, they are repeat entrepreneurs uh, so that we know that when, when shit hits the fan, uh, they will persevere rather than just quit. Uh, I'd also like to see that, you know, in, in terms of, 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 of uh, the structure, structural capital in, in place, um, looking through through cap tables to, to see that there is a, a you know, a, the, the ownership is looks good overall so that nobody has uh, like the, the, the 99% per, of the company and then uh, the two other founders has like, you know, just entered. Um, but really figure out who, uh, who the guys that I invest in and girls, uh, who they are uh, in terms of core and, and sort of where, where they come from and, and what they want to do. The second thing that I look at is, is obviously if this fits into to a market segment that is actually growing, right? Uh, do these solve a substantial challenge within uh, the respective value chains? Uh, and and when, when I sort of have picked off those two, we, we get to the actual sort of more or less business metrics. So, so that would be traction. And so depending if you're, if you're doing a platform or, or like a B2B platform, uh, usually what I try to, to look at there is, is, is pipeline. So, so do they have sufficient pipeline? Is, can I actually help them convert this pipeline? And by putting in my own money, uh, would I help them build it up even faster so that they have enough uh, potential sales to, to scale up the company? Um, if it's more consumer-based, uh, you know, platforms overall, users are, are a great metric and also growth, you know, growth month of a month, see, see what really is under, basically understanding the growth engine of the company, right? And it really depends on which which business you're in, um, but since most of our bus the businesses we invest in are primarily within uh, the B two B segment and software, uh, I usually say I, I look at the pipeline and see if it makes sense, uh, and if there's also you know reason to believe that they can actually convert it. <laughs> mm, that's yeah, that that's awesome, Simon. Thanks for kind of giving an overview of three different types of things you're looking for a team repeat entrepreneurs, uh, the cap table, the pipeline on the B2B side. Okay. And I'm still gonna, I'm still gonna hardball you and be like, I want some numbers too. So what are we looking at? Like really from a pipeline perspective so that the founders here can have benchmarks to understand when their pipelines looking. Yeah, good. sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you're doing, let, let's say you're doing, um, one of the portfolio companies, uh, the a manufacturing company here, uh, that does the, the connection thing. There, it's all about because of the deals. They are so sort of big in terms of magnitude. Um, I would like to see at least like uh, five, ten millions in terms of, of potential sales uh, in the network. Uh, and usually, what that means is that I do a lot of calls to see if it actually you know makes sense. Is, is these customers actually interested? So I do quite a lot of due diligence to get to a point mm -hmm. where 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 um, where I can see for myself, so to say. Um, if we're talking about more like uh, user-based platforms, uh, I usually like to see a a, uh, uh, a growth rate of of two x over two months, uh, mm -hmm. and see that um, a little bit of a lower cap, let's say thousand users or something like that, before before I actually think the cases are interesting. Uh, we really tr try to figure out where the trend is going, 
uh, and see if if uh, this company solves a, a, a problem that people are willing to pay for, because that's sort of the bottom line, right? Um, so yeah, it, it really depends on the different kinds of cases. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, if we have a specific case to discuss, I'm, I'm happy to throw out some, some more hard numbers, but uh, I'd like to see that sort of, you know, growth rate overall that, that it, 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 it grows at least, at least somewhat fast and you can convert some of it into to sales. So it's not just an idea I, on a piece of paper. I love it, Simon. Thank you so much for that. And I, actually, that's a very good segue. If anyone who's listening is wondering if your company, like the, if your company's traction is going to blow away Simon or Peter right now, just drop in your metrics. Why not in the chat? And then we'll tell you if it's actually, and then we can talk about it. We'll just jam on it. So anyone brave enough to actually do that, we'll just see what comes up. Because I think it is interesting, like nice. transparency around what real metrics are, depending on the company. So yeah, feel free to pitch your company where your metrics are, and then we can kind of analyze and look at it and say like, hey, what is this? Is this impressive in comparison with what's going on in the market? How can we do better? So uh, just throwing that out there for the audience right now. All right. And now, Peter, over to you. Yeah, I, I would say I, I don't start off with looking at metrics. Uh, I want to answer uh, a couple of other questions to myself prior to that. And and, and also that's, that also comes from we as a venture capital firm, when we are looking at cases, we are looking at cases that we think and who can be more than 10x our investment. And we realize that not all of our investments are going to be successful, uh, but we, we want to identify and find the ones that have a, a major growth potential. So, so, so that means that we can say no to companies that are re really good companies that are going to grow uh, uh, reasonably well, but we don't think they're going to be uh, as big as we um, uh, would like uh, the company company's target to be. Uh, but so, so for me, uh, uh, before starting looking at metrics, I, I want to um, answer to myself or the team that do do their do the these companies do their customers really love the product or do do the consumers really love the product because if if they don't it will be very very hard to grow the company uh, 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 to two x a year or three x a year uh, which is a scenario you really want to end up in. Uh, so, uh, and I think metrics are very different from very different, uh, very, very different depending on the type of business. But if I'm coming from uh, consumers or customer love the product, then obviously churn is a very important metrics uh, from, from a, from a business, uh, from a SaaS business, we we always obviously always look at the ARR and also quite a lot at the new ARR. Uh, uh, so how how easy is it for you to sign new contracts and contracts that are long term? Uh, one matrix people often talk about is CAC, CAC compared to lifetime value. Obviously, CAC is important, but it, they are there are so many different ways to get your get new customers. So um, uh, let's say one metrics that I'm I'm not looking too much into is the lifetime value uh, divided by the CAC, uh, and especially if the lifetime value is based on a seven-year lifetime of a customer, uh, because that that could change over that period of time. Uh, so I, I more want to answer to myself the question, okay, the, does the customer, do the customers really love the product? Do, does it have a viral effect that they tell their, their customers about it? If, if one person from one company using, using the product, if they move to a competitor, will they start using the product? Do they love the product that much? Um, for me, that's even more important that uh, to get a yes on a question like that than have some some metrics. 
But at, at the end of the day, later down in the evaluation, obviously, obviously we always dig down in, into all the KPIs the company are working with. Makes sense, that does. And I think both of you are raising, Peter, like you're both raising for me this question of when do you expect a company to have product market fit? And are you investing primarily post product market fit or pre product market fit? And how do you define product market fit? Yeah, and, and that, that, depi that depends on the type, type of product as well. Uh, we, we, we have invested in, uh, in businesses uh, that, uh, that uh, have yet to prove the product market fit or uh, even don't have a product on the market. For example, uh, game, gaming company, then uh, when you've proven that you have the product market fit, uh, then, then, then you're already becoming great. So th there you invest in lot in lot, there you invest a lot in the ID and the team and the experience on, on the team. We invested in a company where that develop software for audio recognition and making an or better audio experience. Uh, th in that scenario as well, we believe in the team and their capacity to to really make this make this a uh, worldwide success. Uh, and so there you do there you have a very limited number of KPIs or metrics to look at when you invest. Um, then you have to make a judgment call on the product and the team instead. Got it. No, that's super helpful. And then Simon, same question for you in terms of um, expectations around product market fit and how, how you measure product market fit. Yeah. And is that, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I think that I, like mo most of our investments are, are pre product market fit. Yeah. Uh, most of our investments are, are pre seed. So, so it's basically just trying to land a product into market and see what, what people say about it. And, and something that resonates quite well with me that Peter sort of said uh, is the, the, uh, the superhuman experiment that, that or superhuman uh, sort of metric that, that, uh, that you can do and, and I kind of like. And it basically goes something like, uh, if I were to delete the product today, um, yes. how many people would, would, would miss it, right? How very disappointed that it disappeared. Uh, I think that says a lot about uh, whether or not you you have the right kind of user base that you work work towards. Um, but then also circling back a little bit because I like the way Peter took a step back. Uh, sort of sort of the my problem, right? My problem is to to return a fund uh, usually and find the right cases that returns a fund. And so a prerequisite for for finding those cases is just like Peter said, the the, the cases that we invest in they need to be able to do bottom line ten x. Otherwise, I you know it, it's it's too small in terms of scope. And so the, the question is really, how do you build a, 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 a hundred, uh, hundred million dollar company uh, in terms of value? And, and do you have the potential to do that? Uh, so, so really that, I say that's the you know, bottom line uh, somewhere um, to really think about how, you, how you're supposed to scale your company to such, such limits and, and not get stuck up. So, Scalability is something that we really haven't haven't talked about yet, but that's super important as well, right? To understand that your 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 business actually scales well uh, mm -hmm. and isn't too capital intensive in terms of scaling it. Obviously, most businesses are capital uh, expensive um, and and specifically in deep tech, but but nevertheless, there needs to be some some kind of leverage on the capital that you get in in order to to build something that's sustainable long term and can grow to become something great. Okay, Simon, quick follow-up on this. And also, thanks, everyone. There's lots of good questions going on inside the chat, and we will definitely start bringing them in uh, right like in the next couple of minutes. Um, Simon, you're talking about scalability is super important and understanding your business scales well, yet your investments tend to be pre-product, market fit, pre-seed. Yeah. So I guess what I'm trying to understand is how do you know when a pre-seed, pre-product, market fit product, it, like what indications do you have of scalability when they're so <laughs> early? <laughs> like how... <laughs> I, I, it's like growth. I talk to growth stage companies and they're still trying to figure out processes and scalability. Yeah. Like how the hell do you know scalability with a pre-product mark? So just tell, tell, talk to me a little bit more about that. Well, the, the honest answer is that we don't. Uh, yeah. And it really comes down to the people that we invest in. Do we believe that they can, can do this? Uh, do we believe that they'll pivot enough uh, when, when it's required of them and persevere uh, through the challenges that they will face uh, in order to, to build something great? Uh, 
that, that's for me that's that that, that weighs quite heavily right uh, but then you need to have an idea that that's you know uh, I, I basically my, my sort of threshold is do I get excited by this idea does it does it make sense to me can I see this problem in the real world uh, and and this is something that I really want want to happen right that's 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 a lot of prerequisite before we actually get to to growth metrics and when you sort of find your product market fit because it takes a long time I mean, the the nav computers that we we've looked at their go to market strategy is like five years out <laughs> so, so we we don't frankly know but it, we know that, that this will happen and so we need to place a bet and so basically we place a bet on on uh, on good people I love that. So it's, yeah, it's almost like scalability as perseverance as a bet on the team that, that this team will potentially be scalable in some point. Um, and, and in, yeah. in, in, in addition, um, you, you take into a lot of other parameters as well. Is a business opportunity large enough, for example? Uh, do we have the same objectives, the founders and the investor? Do, do we share the same vision? Uh, I mean, we, 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 uh, we're gonna work together for five, ten years in order in order to make this a success that both of us want to do. Uh, and do we enjoy working together? And if I add one last thing here for the founders, to do they show the passion for the business? Uh, do are they on fire when they are talking about the business? Uh, that, that is what you want to be a part of. Amazing. Thank you so much, gentlemen. So I'm going to bring in some questions. Also, I'm very excited by the fact that some brave humans inside our audience are actually sharing their traction with us inside the comment section. So we might actually review those um, <laughs> and see how it's going. Uh, so I think first, first thing, Lisa, Lisa Evans asked a really great question, Peter, for you. It's how do you measure and discover if the customers actually love the products? Right. You mentioned churn. Yeah, what what are some of the qualitative ways to, of looking at this? And then she also asked this brilliant question. What's the best way of showing this in a pitch deck sharing with potential investors? So I'll let you take that one on. And then, Simon, feel free to jump in if you have some insights as well there. Yeah, I, I, as you as you mentioned, the, the obvious KPI is churn, of course. Uh, I, uh, I, I like when uh, a company show different co cohorts and it could be helpful or it could uh, reveal uh, uh, reveal that there were some problems in, in in a certain time period. So what I mean with the cohorts, when when customers coming in a different month over the year, uh, how how long uh, how long have they stayed? How how did their business develop? Uh, that's one way to show that the the, the customer the customer loves the products. Uh, it could mean that. The very early customers, uh, may, maybe they churned, but from a certain period of time when you had X number of features in place, the, from then the customers really love the product and they increase the number of seats they were paying for or what, whatever metrics you are looking at, uh, uh, spend more dollars. Um, and and then, then you can feel comfortable that, okay, from this period of, from this uh, period of time, all the customers started to love the product and that's what we are investing in. That's great. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, Simon, did you have anything you wanted to add to that one? Otherwise I have another question well, for you. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just uh, give it uh, 10 seconds, but, but yes. I think that churn over I, uh, IRR is, you know, it, what it comes down to is that you need to set a threshold then w what's considered a, a good sort of level of, of churn that makes sense. But most, as you pointed out earlier, most of the investments that we make are pre-seed. And so they, they basically don't know what their churn are or what the RRR are either. Uh, and so then I, I kind of like the superhuman experiment thought. Uh, that's that's something that sort of appeals to me uh, to see if, if people would be sad to see if your product disappeared. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that's my two cents. On the superhuman side, how many people need to be sad? Are we talking like a hundred people are sad, a thousand people are sad, like ten? I mean, just from a because it's, it's just a percentage of people yeah, that so, are sad, like eighty percent of people are sad. Like, what are we talking about here? Yeah, uh, that yes, there is this threshold there mm -hmm. as well. I usually point out like thirty percent, something like that, because okay. I think that makes for an embryo that you can work on and see uh, 
see how you can improve those numbers basically. Got it. That's super great. And then actually follow up for you. I think Simon, this was something that you'd mentioned. Um, let me just make sure I'm pretty sure it was it, one of you said this, but it was around basically <laughs> how you, I'm taking notes and simultaneously watching this chat and then also talking with you. So it's great multitasking, super fun. So, um, so one of you had mentioned, and I think that Simon, it was you that, re uh, repeat founders investing in repeat founders is important to you mm -hmm. from a okay you know that's a signal that they're going to persevere continue doing what they're doing and not quit um david dorling in chat just mentioned i understand one why, why confidence and management team is important but what percentage of your investments are for those first-time founders which i think is a really good question because it's like how do these first-time founders then break in when there is a bias towards repeat yeah. founders which is a necessary bias but at the same time so curious for both mm -hmm. of you how you answer that percentage of investments for first-time founders sure i mean uh it really it really depends on what kind of uh investment hypothesis you work with uh some investors tend to work with hypotheses that are geared towards first-time founders uh, i'd say that for instance y combinator they put a premium on first-time founders uh because they are really trying to figure out the next genius uh kid on the block and trying to to make them uh, presentable for for the larger kinds of investment scenes uh the, the reason why why I like repeat founders, I mean, you, you got to have some kind of proxies uh, when you do investments to find a holistically a good return on investment in, in the cases that you look for. And so the proxies that I work with right now is that I tend to pick up companies from from accelerated programs in Bay Area because they've gone through quite a vetted process. So I usually just look at the 10 percent, top 10 percent of companies because I know that they're sort of in that area. Uh, and I also have a geographical proxy where I only or primarily invest in in the Sweden, Sweden Stockholm region uh, and then also Bay Area because the the chances of finding an outlier is like 10 times higher than if I were to go to to uh, to Spain uh, or, or somewhere else. Uh, and same goes for I have a proxy for for um, for repeat founders as well, because it turns out that if you look, look historically, which, which is not a you know, great metric if you're looking for it, but uh, uh, like the ones that end up building these like billion dollar companies or hundred million dollar companies, they tend to be repeat entrepreneurs. 70% uh, mm -hmm. of, of the, the founders that build those kinds of businesses are repeat entrepreneurs. And so it's a way for me to basically just hedge myself. But saying that, obviously I miss quite a lot of opportunities. Uh, so, so, so I miss out on, on those, those first time founders. Um, and so what I try to do is have an open mind, although I already have a bias towards it, but at least listen in and see if this makes sense. And if I can uh, put some structure in place to help these kinds of founders to, to, to grow. Uh, but, um, it, you know, it's, it, it's two different mindsets. Do I want to teach the new generation of entrepreneurs to make their business and way into the market? Or would I like to invest in something that, that, uh, most well have higher chances of, of success. And so, um, but I, I, I sway the one way, um, <laughs> obviously, but uh, I, I try to keep an open mind and, and uh, figure out how I can bring in more first time founders as well. Thank you for that, Simon. Awesome, I think, Peter. You. Yeah, I think for first time founders uh, have super, super potential as well to make success successful uh, companies. Uh, one reason to get a, a plus in on the sidebar for repeat founders is that they they might have done a couple of mistakes before, uh, so that they avoid those same mistakes this time. If you as a first time founder can show that 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 you are you have a, a different abilities to uh, avoid those mistakes and get some external advice from other people that have those experience, etc. cetera. Uh, then I hope that you as a first time founder will be as successful as a repeat founder. Amazing. Thank you both for that. That's actually super helpful. And it resonates with a lot of um, similar experience that I've had interviewing good unicorn founders. I actually explicitly speak with Simon, you're talking about unicorns, right? So it's like, um, I do a lot of interviews with founders of not just normal unicorn companies, but actually good unicorns that are in service of our people and planet. And it's similar. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say 85% of the founders I've talked to are repeat founders. And there's a couple that break through that are first time founders, but it's really like, you've got to be on a different kind of acceleration path there. Um, 
Okay, so I'm looking at time. We have 10 minutes. I want to make sure there's time for the questions. And then also, uh, I like how Gustav Larson actually put his metrics out there. And then I was just thinking, oh man, that's, we're probably going to, I wish I could just pull Gustav you on to this chat so we could actually do a Q&A, but I don't know how to do that. So if anyone from the team is on here that actually wants to tell me how to do that, we can figure that out. But before we go into that, um, you know, I want to dig into what are common red flags and the, the top mistakes that you see founders making in pre-seed and seed stage that both of you have just seen as a recurring theme that you're just like, let's just nip this one in the bud. Like these are the most common issues and try to avoid these if you can. All right, Simon, go first and then Peter. <laughs> okay, so I think that uh, one, one thing that is a red, I, I mean, for me, it's obviously about the right kind of people. And, and so uh, there needs to be a, a good motivation why you're doing this and not something else, because they will, this will, this will eat up your life. I mean, it, it, it really, it's, it's a, it's a day and night job to, to, to build a company. Um, and, and so red flags are, are people that, that has other plans doing other sides on the sideline, having more than one startup, uh, and also, I think that there's a little bit of a of a trend of being an entrepreneur uh, that I don't kind of like in particular. Like lifestyles, entrepreneurs overall are not something that speaks to me or appeals to me because it's it's not really about the lifestyle. It's just it's just a lot of pain. I think that there's a, there's a famous Elon Musk quote. It's it's like you know eating glass and staring into the abyss. Uh, that's what it's like to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> and once you do that long enough, you'll eventually end up either succeeding um, or you'll just, you know, die. <laughs> Eating too much glass. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, but so, so that's our, our, a couple of red flags for me. And that's primarily based on that. I look quite a lot into the people that I, I invest into rather than, than, uh, just the business model, but then there are plenty of red flags in the business model as well, right? If you if you have a if you faked up, faked your way in into a, a sales pipeline, for instance, it's quite easy to big, build a big sales pipeline. But if it if it's like one percent chance you'll convert one of them, then that that's you know, it, it's not really a, a sales pipeline, right? And I think that there are some trends that, that people tend to inflate their their pipelines and also their traction. Mm -hmm. um, and I will figure it out because I, I am a thorough person, right? So, so <laughs> when I figure it out, that's a red flag. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're like calling it up. You're like, hey, is this real? <laughs> no, yeah, literally, yeah. If I, if 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 someone claims to have a a, a company that they work with, yeah. I, I do call them and I ask for references. And if they say no, then that's you know that's a big no <laughs> for me. <laughs> totally, totally. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Simon. That's super helpful. Um, Peter, what about for you? Common red flags, biggest mistakes you see founders making in pre-seed and seed stage? Uh, uh, building too much of, um, trying to make the, pro the product perfect before they launch it. Uh, I, That's a good I, one. I, I, try, I try to advocate to take uh, more of a lean approach, uh, start, start testing out things. Uh, don't be afraid to talk to customers very, very early. Develop the product together with the customer so you have a couple of clear customer cases one, once you're ready. Uh, and uh, don't be too secretive about what you what you do. You probably you probably learn a lot more by talking to different people about your thinking, etc. And you get some a lot of external input. Uh, in order to do it better and avoid mistakes. So I, th I think obviously it's all about prioritization. There are so many things that should be done at the same time and uh, preferably yesterday. So uh, you need to choose what things to do. Uh, and if you are able to avoid a couple of mistakes by having good, good discussion with the right people, uh, that that could save you a lot of time ending up finding the best product and uh, hopefully a lot of great customers to that product. That's awesome. No, you guys are so, this, these are such great answers. Um, and so I think the question I'd love to just end with is basically the entire premise of this session, which is how do you actually blow away VCs at seed stage? Um, and I know we've covered a lot of ground. So maybe I think 
Mm, if anything you haven't touched on, that would be core to answering this question of how do you, if I'm a founder coming to you saying, how do I, like, like, how do I just blow you away? How do I make you like, think this is incredible or building you've, you've gone through so many points, maybe a, a quick synopsis of po possibly the top three, um, things that would just really strike you from, uh, from, from a, uh, from a, wow, that this is just an incredible startup that I just want to be a part of, you know? If I, if I then would condense it to one thing, uh, yeah. work a lot on your fundraising story. When, when at, at least when you start going out to VCs, try to figure out what is the VC looking for? Am I the right fit for the VC? If that's the case, uh, find your fun, fundraising story. And what I mean with that is what message do you want to deliver? Uh, what and the key points and the supporting facts and arguments in order to live, deliver this me message. And um, for me, it's not about presenting slides. It's, it's presenting a story. And then if there are some slides supporting that, great. But it's a, it's a story and why you will become the next unicorn, hopefully, but at least a very, very successful company. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. And then Simon, what about for you? Yeah, I, I, that resonates well with me yeah. as well. I think that if you tell a good story, tell me a story that I'd like to listen to. <laughs> I mean, that's basically it, right? Uh, tell me about why this is awesome and, and how you sort of came across this opportunity, because that's, if you, if you are, if you are that kind of person who comes across opportunities, you're likely to do that once you get even deeper into the space. Uh, and so as you know, a good story and I will listen. Uh, and, and, uh, storytelling is, is an art and in and of itself. So, so, uh, really that, that's, that, uh, that's a good point. Um, Right. Then That's also, amazing. you know, have the right kind of motivation for it as well, right? So, yeah. so that you don't do this for, for vanity metrics or, or anything like that, but rather because you genuinely believe that this is something that I, I couldn't, I could not do it, like I, not, not do it. Uh, so so uh, if you feel so strongly about your startup, that will, that will, all the problems that you tried to solve, that will shine through. And that's something that uh, I appreciate. It's amazing. Okay. Are there, Simon, Peter, are there any questions I did not ask you that I'm, I'm sure that we could talk for like 14 hours, but anything that I haven't asked that you're dying to share, whether it's like about a company or about a thing that's going on or a new news update or your holidays, I don't know, like anything that you'd like to share in the next couple of minutes before we just like miraculously transition into a metaverse that I really don't know what's happening. So Jason, like if there's a metaverse we're supposed to transition into or some sort of thing, like maybe you can help me do that. But um, in the meanwhile, Simon, Peter, any last words for the, for the group? Uh, no, thank you for the, for the questions. Uh, if I knew the questions, I would have prepared the answers, but uh, I, I had answers for a lot of other things. No, the great discussion. Thanks a lot. Of course. Yeah, I agree with Peter. I, I really enjoy this, this open conversation, not knowing really what the question will be like. Uh, I think that makes for an honest conversation somewhere. Yeah. And then a final sort of uh, a warning, if you're out in the snow today, just be careful because it's, for one, well, I'm up in Uppsala, by the way, in the actual studio. So uh, there is a big security conference going on in Orlando. So I'll probably get stuck in traffic on my way back home. So if you're here, take it slow, don't rush it. And uh, hope you have a nice holiday. And also nice talking to you, Diana. Yes, anytime, friends. Okay, this is awesome. So everyone listening, definitely get connect with Simon and Peter on LinkedIn. Ask them all kinds of questions. Keep the conversation going. Share your metrics with them. They'll tell, hopefully, I'm not going to volunteer them. If they have time, they might tell you if the metrics make sense or not on a traction perspective. Um, and then now I think we're supposed to transition. Does anyone know what happens here? Because uh, I definitely don't know what's going on. Jason, <laughs> let, let, let's see if we have a link. Okay. Start now. Mm -hmm. Let's see. There's supposed to be a networking. Do we go to random networking world? Maybe that's what happens. Um, I, I know I created that's... an av avatar earlier today. So um, uh, now, now I'm going to test that one out. So you actually have it on the car. Uh, when I clicked on a link, it said 
something, then then I created an avatar and uh, ended up in a room. Okay. Okay. I, so I can't see that link now. Let's let's see. Um, okay, I'm gonna suggest then that if we don't know where the link is, uh, everyone feel free to go into random networking. And hopefully I don't get in trouble for sending everyone to the wrong. Oh, upstart.world, Gustav, what a savior. Oh, incredible. Um, so in the chat, there's a little link upstart.world. Um, apparently that is where our metaverse is. And we gather around, oh, that's it. Thanks everyone. Okay, so nice. I think we can just jump out of here and go over there and thanks for everything and the great questions from the audience and we'll see you in the metaverse. Bye.